Hey all you heroes, hawks, heralds, crows, pirates, and wardens. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we unpack, discuss, and galaxy brain about all the lore behind the Dragon Age series. We are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe, from character deep dives to exalted marches and elven gods. We will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we talk about Dragon Age and it's complicated and robust and contradictory and apparently for the month of October, spooky. Lore of Dragon Age. I am one of your hosts, Austin, also known as Teacup, and I'm here with my other host. I'm Shelby or Sheacup, and apparently it is Spooktober. Yeah, so we're talking about spooky things. Yeah, apparently we are discussing some creepy, weird, and maybe just Halloween-ish themed creatures. Today we're going to jump into two. And at first you may be thinking, you know, well, we're, we're talking about griffins and we're talking about something even weirder than that, the scaled ones. So at first you may be thinking, you know, she cup, griffins aren't creepy at all. However... Um, part of their story is pretty uncomfortable and frightening. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. So I think we should just dive right in and get going. All right. Well, let's talk about some fun facts with griffins. So before we, well, before we talk about fun facts, just as a reminder, what a griffin is, a griffin is like a large flying creature that has the body of a lion and the head's the heads, wings, and claws of an eagle. This is a pretty common creature in mythology, so it's not like Dragon Age created the idea of a griffin, um, but they do put their own unique spin on it. So in Dragon Age lore, the griffins became extinct during the Exalted Age. Fun facts. In the Griffin's Helm description, which is a item you can get in Dragon Age Origins, Griffins are referred to as aerials, which is interesting to me. Aerial, like flying aerial. Um, You can also, interestingly, in Dragon Age Origins, find Grey Warden armor for Griffin riders specifically in the Grey Warden vault in Denerim. And my last and most interesting fun fact for Griffins is that according to a letter we find in the World of Thetis Encyclopedia Volume 1, Griffins originally came from the island of Saharan. Which, like, is a island, if I remember the lore, that has all kinds of range and abnormal creatures that bring it. Yes, and I think it kind of makes sense, like, if you think about griffins have the body of a lion. Well, actually, no, because Saharan is a jungle, and lions don't live in the jungle. Lions live in, like, the deserts in Africa, mostly. So, I don't know. It's weird, but also there's some lore that, like, um, when they moved to the Hunterhorn Mountains and the Anderfells and all that that area where Weishaupt is, um, they thrived there but like griffins basically refused to to live in any other part of thetis so uh, we don't really know wait in the jungle the lion sleeps tonight so i looked it up that's a song yeah but they don't live in jungles which just changed my entire life you know the tiger lives in jungles yes not not the lion yeah so you can't say you never learned anything by listening to this podcast all right so let's get into the backstory of the griffins so just a little bit about what they look like right griffins can grow to be over 12 feet tall from their beak to their tail and their wingspans are typically even larger than that male griffins uh typically weigh over a thousand pounds regularly they can be smaller but often they are more than that 
Female griffins are a little bit less than that, but their beaks, both genders, are powerful enough to break bones and claws are strong enough to shred armor. Griffins are also most expressive through their eyes. They usually have bright golden colored eyes and are able to communicate at some level, at least, with their riders. Their fur and plumage, their feathers, vary from black to white and most fall into the gray color range. A lot of gray wardens believe that it was this coloration of the griffins that inspired the name of the gray wardens. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. And then I have a quote from Last Light that I want to read because I think this kind of sums them up well. It says, they, meaning the Griffins, were never servants, never slaves. A Griffin was a partner and an equal, or else it was a foe. And this really reminds me of the Hala and the way that the elves talk about the Hala. Um, and if you if you don't remember, that was way back in season four. And, you know, it has very similar sentiment. If you don't respect this animal, if you don't respect and treat this creature with care, it is, it is not going to go well for you. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've kind of seen this as a theme because if I remember the Bronto episode was also like that. Um, Like if you didn't treat a Bronto right, it would turn on you as well. So like I said, like we've just talked about, you have to respect Griffins. Otherwise they will end you. Um, And we really only associate them with gray wardens because we don't know anything else about their history. We have this idea that they came from Saharan, but other than that, like we genuinely know nothing about their backstory or their history, um, which is unfortunate. It's definitely an area of things I want to know more about, at least with their association with the Grey Wardens. We know that they did establish a process for like training and all of that with the Griffins. They would be trained by specific Griffin trainers of the Wardens, and the two of them obviously would then, you know, form bonds. But once they were fully trained, however, rather than like the warden choosing a griffin, the griffins chose their own riders. This is because they basically refused to carry a rider that they did not want or respect. Therefore, the bond between a rider and a griffin was strong and unyielding. Like you cannot separate the two. When a griffin or a rider died, it was said that the partner often mourned for the rest of their life. I know this is big Aragon vibes, which is what Austin's like writing is comments in the notes. Yeah. Yeah. So big Aragon vibes for sure. Um, But the warden in charge of the care of the griffins was known as the roost master and the high constable, who was second in command, was the aerial commander during times of war. So, you know, with the uh, with the Grey Wardens, like, structure and um, authority hierarchy, you can really see how important the Griffins are. That, okay, the second in command, like, you're in charge of how the Griffins operate in in war. So that's really significant, I think. Do you have thoughts so far? Um, it's just interesting to me that like there is they're placed so high up there and like obviously not every Grey Warden gets a Griffin. There's only a select few that even mm-hmm. get the chance to become a Griffin. And even then it's possible that a Griffin doesn't choose you. Right. And it just makes what's coming all the more tragic. That's also true. And I also think, I think because of Dragon Age Origins, we have this perception that, and even Inquisition, we have this perception that the Grey Warden Order is very small. There's not a lot of people in the Wardens. And I don't think that that's accurate. Um, at least in Last Flight, we see you know, tons and tons and tons of people that live at Weishaupt. And of course, like that's in the middle of a blight for sure. But even when there's not a blight, there's still a lot of wardens. Um, and I I don't think that that's something that the, the games have depicted well. No, I kind of agree that they kind of paint them as this small, like very select order. But I wonder like, and I haven't read Last Flight in its entirety, so that's getting there. But like, 
is everyone at White Stop like a tainted Grey Warden? Like, are there people who work with the Grey Wardens who have not gone under the joining? Well, they definitely do have recruits there. But I don't know if they have, like, servants and, like, custodians who are not wardens. Yeah, I just think it would be really interesting because, like, I think we don't get a lot of, like, how much an actual force the wardens are because in all the games they're operating in small groups sent for a specific task. Yeah, I hear that. I completely agree. And also, like, since Origins, like, we haven't been in a blight. So there hasn't been really the need for them in large numbers. Um, But let's get back to Griffins. So we got to talk about their extinction, right? I don't know. I've said Griffins are. Griffins have. So I haven't been speaking in past tense, and there's a reason for that. So according to Leanne Merciel who is the author of the book Last Flight. And if you want to know more about the story of the Griffins, that is the book to read. It is really, really good. It's really well written. I enjoyed it a lot. Anyway, the survival of the 13 Griffins is what she's talking about. And she says that the survival of the 13 Griffins into the Dragon Age was partially inspired by the Norwegian Lundehund, which at one point was reduced to only six dogs in the world, five of whom were from the same mother. Through very careful breeding decisions, the breed was saved and now has a population in the thousands. So this is, you know, a species of dog um that they have like or wolf i don't really know um that they have brought back and that has not been extinct so she's saying that her story from last flight takes inspiration from this so let's get into it now i'm not going to give you a summary of the whole entire book um because that will be a different episode eventually. Um, But we will discuss how the extinction occurred. So essentially during the fourth blight, the wardens were so desperate to fight back against the dark spawn that they put their griffins through a modified version of the joining. This was done to protect them from being infected by the dark spawn, not to use them as weapons. I think that if the gray wardens had done this, intending to use the griffins as weapons i think they would have refused it at first the goal is okay hey like we're just trying to protect you situation however the wardens soon learn that undergoing the modified joining gave the griffins more power they were capable of greater strength and speed their endurance increased and were able to continue fighting even when they had grave injuries it also put the griffins in a very war hungry state of mind and they were basically like always frenzied and they would always attack the dark spawn if uh they appeared like attack on sight. Like they see a dark spawn, that dark spawn is dying kind of thing. Um, and then eventually over the months or years, the taint will drive the Griffin insane. And so even though the tainted Griffins did definitely help them fight the blight, it was devastating because the madness and aggression, it pretty quickly infected all of the Griffins, kind of like a group think mentality um not so it wasn't just related to the ones that had undergone the joining and so it's kind of at this time when all of the griffins are going not crazy but they're they're losing it a little bit um the first warden makes the decision we've got to put down all the griffins and so that's kind of a very 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 short abridged version of what happens um but that's kind of the basics of the plot line however unbeknownst to the gray warden order the gray warden isaya she had a clutch of griffin eggs 13 griffin eggs who were fathered by her brother garahel's griffin crooky tail and isaya was somehow able to purify them of the taint and so 
she very much felt that the the wardens had failed the, the griffins and so she chose to place them in a form of like arcane suspended animation until the all the griffins died out and the wardens had a chance to like appreciate their loss and until a warden came along who like knew could follow the clues that she had left basically so in 942 dragon a gray warden recruit named Valya finally located the clutch of eggs and retrieved 13 healthy griffin hatchlings so that's the story of kind of their extinction and their return what are your thoughts about all of this austin it's interesting to me mainly because I think this story shows another thing of like magic isn't just a force in Thetis that people can use or whatever, but it's like something that is basic to the world. Like it's even like the Griffins are even connected through the sense of magic. And you can even talk about like instinct and learned behavior when they watch their leader Griffins behave a certain way. The other Griffins adapt to that mentality. But it just kind of shows that in there. But I think, I know there's a lot of people online who are excited for the potential of Griffin Returns in DAD. And they are really pointing to this. But I think that there are two things that I think this shows. One, if they can figure out how uh, Isaiah managed to purify the taint out of these Griffins... I think the hero of Ferelden is going to be really interested in that since they're looking for a hero to the calling. Mm -hmm. But also, nothing about what we have experienced from the Wardens in-universe gives me hope that they won't just abuse these new griffins in a new way. Yeah, I think that that's very fair, um, especially, you know, with everything that we see in Dragon Age Inquisition. However, I mean, I think that there is still cause for hope for the Wardens because, like, they've gone through some shit recently, um, especially by the time of Inquisition. Like, the Grey Wardens basically can be in all-out turmoil, um, civil war amongst the Griffin or amongst the Grey Wardens. So I think that there is there is hope that they can kind of come out of that in a better place. And, you know, I'm also concerned that maybe this return of the Dr- Griffins is correlated to something, especially since it happens in 942 Dragon. And we know that communication out of Vysop has ceased. Right. Maybe through some ancestral memories or something like that, the Griffins are taking vengeance on the Great Wardens. That, uh, I think that's a salient theory. And I, for one, good for them kick their asses go gray warden go griffins yeah absolutely um i'm down for that i would really like to see a rebirth of the gray wardens um i i just feel like they are very important to the social fabric of thetis and you guys are, I know a lot of people are, are Grey Warden haters out there. I particularly enjoy them. I don't like all the secrecy around them, but like they're very important to Thetis. And without them, the next time y'all got a blight, it's it's over for for y'all. Like no more Thetis. Hello to Darkspawn world. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think they're important and I would love to see kind of a rebirth or maybe, maybe a, a return to the origins of the Grey Wardens for sure. Yeah. I think with the Grey Warden, so this is the last thing because this is not a Grey Warden episode. Uh, I think one thing that I would like to see is kind of just like more reformation around how they behave when there's not a blight. And what's going to happen to them if they defeat the Seventh Archdemon? Mm-hmm. Like what happens to the Grey Wardens? Yeah. What are you going to continue doing? And I think there's a lot of power structure that needs to be revisited, especially their relation to the Anderfels and where they're set up there. Mm-hmm. You have this, you think the Inquisition 
was a struggle once Corypheus was defeated, and they're like, okay, what are we going to do with this large military force? The Grey Wardens make the Inquisition look like a small band of rebels. Chump change. Yes. Yeah. And especially with an with a, a institution that's so historic as well. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I would imagine there will still be Darkspawn roaming. We just won't have like hordes of them. But anyway, um, so let's get back into Spooktober with <laughs> Griffins and the Scaled Ones. But I think we're done with Griffins. So let's let's head into the midbreak. All right. What makes your ram so special? Well, he's always brought the family luck. And his advice helped us make our fortune. Your ram offered advice. How do you get your hair to do that, Dorian? With magic. With proper hygiene and grooming. Maybe all three of you should get acquainted. Kirkwall's not brown enough for me. But hey, no darkspawn. Berildon wasn't that brown. The dirt and Mac gave it character. Well, welcome to the middle of the show where we take time to first to thank our patrons. Thank you to all of our patrons who support us. We greatly uh, appreciate it. And special thank you to our first patrons, Lisa M and Genesis. And also a special thank you to our Nug King patron, Lewis H. If you'd like to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash DA Lorecast and sign up and support us at various tiers. You get all kinds of benefits from very basic of just no more ads on the show to coming on the show with us and getting your name read out and all kinds of stuff like that. And so we would greatly appreciate any of that support. If you can't do that, totally fine. Totally awesome. Uh, But you can leave us reviews on Apple and Spotify. Or you can come and leave us reviews there. And if you leave us some reviews with some kind words, we'll read it out on the future episode of the show. And so we have 275 uh, Spotify reviews. Let's get to 300. Let's go. If you have not yet rated us on Spotify and you love the show, go give us five stars and help us reach that 300 Spotify review number. We do have a Spotify comment to read today. This from comes from Chloe on the Shale character deep dive. And Chloe says, I listen to this podcast almost every night before bed, and that's become my new routine for months now. I love the podcast so much and have almost gotten through every episode. Awesome work. Thank you, Chloe, so much for your comment. We are glad that we are helping you enjoy Dragon Age and that you love listening to our show. So thank you for the comment there. If you want to come hang out with us, talk with us more than just hearing our voices once a week when you download our podcast episode, you can come and join the Discord and chat with us, talk about our other shows, talk about Dragon Age, talk about... If you, since we don't have a new Dragon Age game and you've been playing Baldur's Gate, you can come and talk about Baldur's Gate with us. You can do all kinds of things to join the Discord. You can find that link in the episode description. And then Shelby has some things she wants to share about regarding some of the recent news coming out about Bioware. Yeah, so I actually have two things. One's about Bioware and one's not. We'll go with the Bioware stuff first. So Bioware is being a fuck, basically, is my opinion. Um, And I know that some of you Bioware people are listening. And um, I just have to say, if you are an executive, if you are a high up CEO, I don't know, C-suite person, like you you need to stop what you're doing and like do something different because this ain't it um if if you're a developer who's listening we love you thank you for your work um i'm sorry <laughs> basically but no seriously like if you are an executive at bioware and by any chance you're listening to this all i have to say to you is shame on you um so for the listeners back it up a little bit A few weeks ago, when we came back from our break, we talked about the Bioware layoffs. They laid off 50 employees, right? We know this. We've covered this. If you don't know about this and you're behind the times, you can either go listen to the mid-break of our Ogren episode, or you can go listen to um, the Mass Effect Lorecast episode about the Bioware layoffs. We were on that episode. They're great over there at the Mass Effect Lorecast. Anyway, so um, on October 3rd, 
John Rennish, who um, was one of the people laid off from Bioware, posted a long screenshot of an article on his Twitter. Um, and the, the headline was terminated Bioware employees sue for better severance. And so kind of the gist of it all is that uh, Bioware won't even pay the fired employees proper severance. So I'm going to read a few quotes from the article. Um, and it says, in most recent court cases of termination without cause, Alberta courts, which is where a buyer is located, have awarded at least one month of severance pay per year of service. So one month of pay per how long, how many years you've worked at the company. Um, with the full value of all benefits included, the severance that BioWare offered to these employees was significantly less than this amount. Several of those ex-employees attempted to negotiate with BioWare for adequate severance, but BioWare refused to increase its severance amounts. Seven employees with an average of 14 years at BioWare have refused to accept BioWare's low offers and have filed a statement of claim with Alberta. Alberta's Court of King's Bench requesting fair severance pay and including a request for punitive damages for what they say is unreasonably poor treatment by BioWare. Um, and then the article has a quote. It says, in light of numerous recent industry layoffs and the fact that BioWare's NDAs prevent us from showing any of our recent work on Dragon Age Dreadwolf in our portfolios, we are very concerned about the difficulty many of us will have finding work as the holiday season approaches, said one of the terminated employees. While we remain supportive of the game we've worked so hard on, and of our colleagues continuing that work, we are struggling to understand why BioWare is shortchanging us in this challenging time. The article continues. I'm not done. It says our Alex Kennedy, who's counsel, who is counsel for the seven employees, says that even in cases where BioWare has contracts that discuss termination, BioWare may have included illegal provisions. Quote, there are many situations where employers include termination provisions that are not enforced by the courts, he said. And I think we see that in this case, too. BioWare attempted to reduce its obligation to these employees well below what the courts typically award, including by eliminating benefits from its termination pay. That appears to be contrary to the Employment Standards Code, end quote. In Kennedy's opinion, these employees deserve generous severance pay. These people are artists and creators who have worked very hard and for a very long time in a difficult industry, producing big profits for their employer. Their termination without cause in mass like this calls for a response. Employers here can terminate anyone at any time without cause, but with that right comes a responsibility to the people they put in that situation. So that is the end of the article quoted, shared from John Rennish on Twitter. I have several things to say. Number one, if any of you people are out here bootlicking for Bioware, you need to quit. Like you, you need to stop. Um, Bioware, the company, is only made up of the developers who create the games, period, full stop. And Bioware, the company is inseparable from the creators who make the game. Bioware, the company, is not the executives who are making these bad decisions. So if you're still bootlicking for Bioware, um, you should stop because this is not okay. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you should not still have hope for Dragon Age Dreadwolf or that you shouldn't play it or that you shouldn't buy it because I don't agree with that statement. Um, and even in this statement, you know, these developers have said they still support um, the people that are still working on the game. And I completely agree with that. However, uh, if there would ever be talk of a, a Dragon Age 5, I'm not sure I could support it at this point in time. Um, so that's that's the first thing. The second thing I want to remind everyone is that EA, Bioware's parent company, is a billion dollar company. There's absolutely no reason they should be treating people like this. Um, and I know this is not just a Bioware problem. This is not just an EA problem. This is a worldwide problem. This is also a gaming industry problem. And we're not okay with it. 
um, people should be compensated fairly for their work. People should make a living wage and people shouldn't aren't, they do not deserve to have their jobs ripped out from under them. Um, so that's a lot. I had a lot of thoughts. I'm not, I'm not happy with Bioware right now. I don't know if you guys have followed us on Twitter, but I've kind of been going on a little bit of a rampage lately. <laughs> Um, which is my tendency and want to do. So, Austin, I don't know. Do you have thoughts about all of this? Comments, um, concerns, etc. I just think, you know, the pay thing is really what is getting me. Like, was I angry about the termination of writers, especially like of the like senior writer staff who had basically been the backbones of Bioware for a long time. Absolutely. I was upset about that. But, you know, I knew, as anyone else do, that sometimes, you know, corporations be like that. And there's nothing legally or anything that can be done. And it is Bioware's, Bioware and EA's prerogative to fire anyone for whatever reason they come up with. But like the lawyer said, they then have a responsibility for the people that they put in that situation. And... With the work of NDAs, imagine like going into a job interview and you can't say anything that you have worked on in the past 14 years. So all the work you can share is now outdated to the industry. So you can't show what you've been doing with these new engines, with the new graphical capabilities of PCs and consoles and all of that kind of stuff. You can't show any of that because of your NDAs. That means that you will not be able to find work. Like mm -hmm. it's not a matter of there, anything that calls these developers like money grabbing or greedy or anything is completely unfounded. This is a moment of survival. They will not be able to work for the tip, basically for the tenure of their NDAs. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's crazy that that's legal. Like it is insane that that you can do that to a person. Like I, I don't know. I just find it so messed up in so many ways. Um and there are so many people out there that are really upset with BioWare and and rightfully so. Um and I, I don't know if anybody in BioWare who who matters, <laughs> who has power is listening. However, you need to be taking this stuff seriously. People are not going to buy this game because of a the horrible um, development cycle. But now, like just from a marketing perspective, like this is not good press for your game. There are going to be people that boycott this game because of this. I mean, this is <laughs> you couldn't have done this in a worse time. Like. UPS, the Teamsters almost went on strike a few months ago. The WGA, SAG, has been on strike for months. Strikes are very common right now. And people have more of a labor consciousness than ever before in like our lifetimes. And so I just feel like this is not the time to screw over your employees and your ex-employees and think you can get away with it. You can't. People are not going to buy your game. And if you're really concerned about the bottom dollar, well, if people don't buy your game, you're going to be screwed. As this, you know, lawsuit continues, they might be fine. They will probably find more developers to you know, establish a pattern. It's possible. It's definitely possible. Anything else to say about Bioware? Um, I love your worlds. I love Mass Effect. I love Dragon Age. I think they're some of the best games that have ever been made in the RPG world. I will stop playing all of them. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, like, we'll quit the podcast. Um, we will. We absolutely will. So... It sucks. Uh, but, you know, Bioware, EA, please, like we're begging you, get your head out of your ass because you're not doing any favors to the gaming community. 
So yeah. let's let's move on a little bit. Um, the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on is we got a submission on our website, which if you didn't know, we do have a website called cupspodcasting.com. Um, and you can send us emails. You can leave us submissions over there if you want to. Um, but someone named Kit, they wrote in to um, – our website about the Fenris episode, um, our Fenris character deep dive. And I just wanted to read their email because it just gave me, it shed so much light on the situation that I I didn't know about. Um, I truly like did not know any of this information because I'm not Canadian. And I, I guess I could have done my research a little bit better. Um, but this is just a little bit of my American bias coming in. So we're going to correct some of what we said on the Fenris episode just a little bit with this email. So this is what Kit said. Hey, all. Firstly, I want to say that I absolutely adore your work and the nuance in which you both explore the universe in universe lore, as well as the real world world context contexts that impact the fiction. You handle it beautifully and it makes me incredibly happy. I listen to y'all all the time. As I listen randomized, I only just came on Fenris's deep dive. I love that guy. Y'all did really good. I just wanted to note that when talking about the nuance of why Bioware may have allowed the choice for players to return to Fenris to return Fenris to his captor, it was briefly noted that Canada has some history of enslavement. It was inferred that the United States somehow had a more substantial history with it. My mother is African American and of a slave trade brought line, and I was born and raised in Canada. So I feel I may have some nuance to add to this discussion, especially as DAD is meant to be into Venter. So being versed on Canada's interaction with slavery may be helpful for future conversations. Basically, Canada has had a 200 plus year of involvement involvement in the transatlantic slave trade and only made slavery illegal roughly 30 years prior to the U.S. While the largest amount of enslaved people were actually transported to Brazil and a lot of the then British owned islands, Canada still received in the hundreds of thousands of enslaved people, many who were then traded with the states. Canada also had a a fair bit of complex enslavement of indigenous people while also selling black slaves to some indigenous groups. The long and short of it all is that Canada has a horrible and long history with slavery, especially the transatlantic slave trade. We often are seen as better because of the myths surrounding the Underground Railroad or our general reputation as a country that apologizes a lot. But at the end of the day, we're just as bad as the rest of the colonial vi- colonially violent states out there, even if our leader's toupee looks a bit more real. Ha ha. Thanks for taking the time to read this. Um, thank you so much for sending us that email kit. I think that's really important history and context and um, important for our listeners to know. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for the education. Um, I knew about the enslavement of indigenous people. On, on Canada, but I did not know how I knew there was involvement in the transatlantic slave trade mm-hmm. were, um, but I didn't know the extent. So I really appreciate that moment to let me know kind of what where that role that's going in and kind of shedding more light on what experience or education the Bioware employees who wrote and designed that game had with this kind of issue. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, let's get back into it. All right. Have a care where your eyes linger, Alistair. Yes. Well, don't worry. It's not what you think. I see. I was looking at your nose. And what is it about my nose that captivates you so? I was just thinking that it looks exactly like your mother's. I hate you so much. I was one of the crows you hired to kill the Grey Wardens. I thought you looked familiar. Well, I just wanted to report that I failed my mission, Logan. You don't say. I'm terribly broken up over it. Hmm. Well, thank you kindly for informing me. You fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is... Okay, so this is really where the spooky part of this episode comes into play because we're talking about a mysterious reptilian race that we have no idea what they really are or where they came from. And we really also don't know their name, but we call them the Scaled Ones. 
So general backstory. Um, just about all of the information we got about these mysterious creatures comes from the codex entry titled Chronicles of a Forgotten War from Dragon Age Inquisition's Descent DLC. Also, just to kind of give a, a little information beforehand, I know this season is like technically about creatures. This is less of a creature and more of a like uh, species, but... I kind of lumped it together because we know so little about them. But anyways, we know that they are tall humanoid creatures that are covered in scales. They have very powerful jaws and sharp talons. Their warriors did wear fine armor and carry weapons while their priests dressed in robes and they were able to breathe out and cast fire. So, yes, like I said, to be fair, less of a creature, more of a species Because they do use a language to communicate, we just don't know what it is. We also know that they waged war among the dwarves sometime around the founding of Tevinter in minus 1195 ancient, but before the destruction of Catalash Tig in minus 975 ancient. So, like, somewhere in that 200-year span, the Scaled Ones and the dwarves have a massive war. We've, we've never heard anything about them since this, though, and we have nothing in the historical record to point to them or indicate otherwise, which, to be fair, could just be explained away by um, the dwarven, the, the dwarven shapers basically just covering over those memories. So I'm going to read the codex entry that we have about them, and you can tell me what you think. This is... Um, It's not the whole codex. I'm just taking bits and pieces of it, the important parts. Um, So write down any questions or comments you have while I'm reading. The Scaled Ones. I can't remember who came up with the name, but it stuck. Drogue had been lighting a torch when one attacked, and we finally caught a glimpse of something other than shadows. In the flame's light, we saw a man's body like those of the Imperium humans, but covered in scales. It wore armor and even had a dagger hanging from its hip. Its jaws wrapped around Drogue's face and twisted. The crunch of his neck breaking seemed to echo down the deep roads. The torch fell from his hands and we lashed out. Othon, the best of us, made the first kill by splitting a scaled one's head open. There was a strange silence, as if after an upset in the proving grounds, and it hit me that these beasts were not used to seeing one of their own die. Drogue's killer growled and stamped out the torch. The Scaled Ones retreated into darkness. The Scaled Ones had set up camp at an intersection in the Deep Roads. In the center, there was a golden altar fashioned in the shape of fire. A chill swept through me. On the tip of each flame hung the corpses of those we'd lost, including Father and Drogue. They had been drained of blood, leaving only bone wrapped in gray skin. A robed, scaled one stood before the altar. Its voice was different from the others, softer, almost feminine. It chanted and raised a basin of blood towards the altar. The other scaled ones bowed low. The robed, scaled one produced fire from its palm and mouth and ignited the blood. Otan led us down the path to the overlook. I readied my axe for blood and steeled myself for the sight of the altar but it wasn't there. The camp, father and drogue, the scaled ones, all gone. Only the basin remained charred around the edges. End quote. So what the hell are these things is my question. I just, I see down in the notes later that you have a comparison to another Bioware universe. Mm -hmm. But I just have to mention something that is mentioned so in the elder scrolls universe there are a bunch of extinct races we have our standard like the argonians which are obviously like reptilian we have you know men elves cat people orcs, all that kind of stuff but there's a race of reptilian snake-like creatures that have connection to what's called the akaviri which is like this kind of 
Southeast Asian type culture. Um, it's unclear in the Elder Scrolls lore. I'd have to get the, our friends from the Elder Scrolls lore cast to come and clarify some stuff for me. But it's unclear whether or not the Akaviri race was reptilian or not. But there was a race of reptiles that the Akaviri and others kind of went to war with. And that these race of reptiles also warred with the Dwemer, which are sometimes called dwarfs in Elder Scrolls lore, though they're not dwarfs as we think of them in traditional, like, Tolkien sense. They're, the Dwemer are a race of elves. And so I just think the similarities in this kind of lost race and their connection with the dwarfs in there, like, this be a Elder Scrolls reference. I think that's a fair comparison. I just am curious what the Akaviri look like in the Elder Scrolls. Do we have any information about that? It's unclear. Um, and part of the things, like you think Dragon Age lore is convoluted, which it is. Uh, all of Elder Scrolls lore comes from in-game perspectives. There is no like omniscient narrator who mm -hmm. is speaking from like, this is how it was. Everything is from an in-game source, like an in-universe writer is writing this. And so there are conflicting reports gotcha. and we don't really know. But most images I could find in this in the last five minutes uh, sometimes shows like a snake-like creature, which I think these are more bipedal. Mm -hmm. um, in Retrospect, but sometimes they're walking and they are just like staley or whatever. Um, but again, if we wanted to compare this, I'd have to get someone who knows Elder Scrolls lore a little bit more mm -hmm. to come on here. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair comparison. I think there are a lot of comparisons that we can make. Uh, my favorite one by chance um, is that, you know, given that we see a trophy of a Krogan head in the Winter Palace. Is it possible that they could be Krogan? Um, there is a picture of the scaled ones that we have, I believe, from the um, World of Thetis Encyclopedia. And it's very Krogan-esque, in my opinion. Uh, the, the shape is the same. The legs are very similar. The Krogan's heads are just a little bit more like upright i i would say um but it's it looks very similar to a krogan so i think that's entirely possible but there's also a really fun theory that they are perhaps the kossith the race that predates the kunari um we don't really have any any ind indication of that otherwise it's just an idea um there's also another theory that i also like um is that they could be reavers that took the dragon blood too far, which I think completely ties into the part of the codex that's talking about the priests and lighting the blood on fire and drinking the blood and all of that. Um, but we also know that there are some evidence in the games, I think uh, mentioned from uh, ambient dialogue from Cassandra, that there are some reaver pentagasts who ended up growing scales after, you know, drinking too much dragon blood. Um, so could that be they turned into this after that? Um, I think all of these things are possible. I'm not necessarily saying, OK, this is the right answer. I'm just lifting up lots of different options. Or, like, another thing for me, could they be, because we know that the taint affects animals a lot differently than it does the humanoid races. Of yeah. Things. Could these be some kind of blight mutated lizard? Like, some lizard walking around the deep roads, came in contact with Darkspawn, and... I would understand that theory if they were not sentient. Mm, yeah. Well, we have sentient dark spawn. Yeah, but all of the animals that become infected by the dark spawn taint, they don't spontaneously become sentient. I guess that's true. That's true. Um. Anyway, I am very fascinated by the scaled ones. Want to know more about them. Um. But that's pretty much all we know. We don't know a ton about them. 
So do we want to talk about our side character pretty quickly? Yeah, let's go on. All right. So our side character is a gray warden by the name of Utha. And she is a female dwarf and former silent sister, which means she does not speak. We have seen her in game, but she has a much bigger presence in the calling book by David Gator. So because she's a silent sister, she doesn't speak and she primarily uses sign language to communicate. And she actually joined the Grey Wardens to avenge her family who the Darkspawn had slain. So we see her a lot in the calling and we'll get into where we see her in game after the calling. But in the calling, Utha's commander of the Grey, Genevieve, had vi- visions of her brother and former commander, Bregan, that had been captured by the Darkspawn. He was one of the only Grey Wardens with knowledge of the remaining old gods, where they were. So obviously it was super dangerous if he was captured, which he was. Spoiler alert. Um, Utha was one of the only Grey Wardens to believe in Genevieve's visions about her brother. In 910 Dragon, Genevieve leads out leads a company out to search for Bregan. Utha is among this company. While in the Deep Roads, they experience a lot of things on their journey. Um, They end up in the Fade, which is where Utha experiences a dream of being back with her family. She can also speak, unlike in the real world. Even if she's aware that it is a dream, she still spends some time with them. And after she gives her farewell to her family, she repeats the oath that she gave to avenge them. Once this is done, Utha's dream disappears, and she, along with the others, are back in the ever-changing environment of the Fade. Um, Eventually, they get back to the Deep Roads, and then they get overrun by Darkspawn, and they wake up in a cell where they are then visited by Genevieve, Bregan, and, you guessed it, the Architect. Genevieve tells them of the architect's plan of killing the remaining old gods, ending all future blights, and invites the captured group to join the architect, too. However, only Utha agrees to do so. The architect releases her and quickens with blight magic the taint inside of her, which turns her into a ghoul as well. The book continues with its conflict, but for the discussion of Utha, the main point that we need to know is that she stays by the side of the architect. Even when she's told that his ultimate plan is to make every person on Thetis into a ghoul, thinking this will stop the blight, she still supports him, even then. So, in Origins Awakening, we meet Utha again. In the aftermath of the fifth blight, she is still at the side of the architect and she's the dwarf that we often see alongside of him. She often offers very violent solutions to his problems, uh, but she never says a word. And so we kind of have to infer all of her dialogue from the architect's responses. The architect mentions that she has a past as a gray warden and suggests that it promised her that um, they would kind of form an alliance with the wardens. Utha was the first gray warden to donate her blood for the architect's research. And thanks to her contribution, the architect was able to reverse engineer the gray wardens joining and kind of like modify it so that it would grant his disciples like the gray warden resistance to the taint. So, With this modified joining, the architect was able to disrupt um, the Darkspawn's connection to the old gods and anyone really who followed him and give them kind of self-awareness. So that's kind of the whole purpose of Utha with um, the architect's plan is that she's the one that kind of serves to get him his like Darkspawn army that serves him and only him and not the other old gods. And then I have two little pieces of trivia about Utha, which is that her family came from Ortan Taig. And another Mass Effect reference, there is a planet named Utha in Mass Effect 2. All kinds of references across those two games. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Like, the architect is so interesting to me because, like, it's very like Ultron kind of esque of like I'm gonna destroy the world because that will save it, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of like Solus is also kind of like that as well. 
but it's interesting to me because Corypheus is not. Corypheus is like, I'm going to get power for myself. And if the world burns in the process, I don't care. Right. And like, I think the thing about it is the architect masquerades as a good guy, but like, can you trust him? I don't think you can trust him. No, because he he's so singularly focused that if he needs to sacrifice you or do something to maintain that goal, he's not going to hesitate to do so. Yeah. Um, but Utha, it's interesting to me and like because she can't speak, we don't really get her motives. Like, no. we don't know why she joins this architect or anything. Yeah, I think we get a little bit from the book, but the book is not her perspective. So, again, we still don't really get the full picture. Um, and to me, when I read the book, I was kind of blindsided that any Grey Warden would ally themselves with literally an old god. Literally an old god. That's what the architect is. Right. Um, well, uh, Magister. Old God Magister, whatever. Yeah. Yes. I think, and like, I know that in the calling, and again, haven't finished that, but Dina. Um, you need to. But Utha has like some kind of like weird bond with Genevieve. Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't remember that. It's been a long time since I've read the book. Well, just that, like, she is the one who follows her to find Bregan, and it's all of that. And so I wonder if the fact that Genevieve had kind of sided with the architect, if Utha does that because it's Genevieve who's asking. Yeah, it's possible. Um, It's possible. All right. Well, um, Definitely a spooky episode. Lots of uh, references to the calling and awakening and the deep roads and just spookiness. So that's about all I've got for this episode, Austin, if you want to wrap it up. Before we go, a uh, special thank you to our Nug King tier patron, Lewis H., who gets thanked at the end of every episode. And thank you all for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. You can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, join our Cups Podcasting and More Discord server. It's easily the best place on the internet. You can also support us financially through our Patreon. You can find us there on patreon.com slash Dragon Age Lorecast. The Dragon Age Lorecast is part of the Robots Radio Network. For more information about the Robots Radio Network, join the Discord server via the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed the show or learned something new today, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join the Patreon. And if you enjoyed our intro and outro music, give a big thank you to Pipe Man Studios. Thank you, Pipe Man. Thanks again for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next time. How well do you know your video game lovers? Have you ever wondered how your video game bays stack up against all the other delectable digital dates? I'm Genesis, the girl whose motto in life is love, laugh, tequila. And on Two Girls, One Ship, we analyze, rate, and review all that the world of video game romances has to offer. And I'm Vervada, the hopeless romantic cat lady and lifelong gamer. But you should know that our podcast centers on character and romance analysis and doesn't shy away from exploring the fun of physical connection. Or from the deep emotional connections built between two characters, using specific in-game dialogue, and the overall narrative journey. So join the two girls, one ship, shipsters, and remember... Beauty is in the eye of the controller.